Please be seated as we offer a prayer to understand scripture. Source of all wisdom in the midst of all of our distractions, focus our attention on you. In the midst of competing voices, attune our ears to hear your word. For we seek bread for our journey through Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. I humbly offer your blessing. <laughs> I need an uncluttered platform here. Our scripture this morning is uh, 2 Corinthians. Am I too loud for you? No? Okay. I'm loud for me. But it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And I'm kind of coming into the middle of a story, but I'll clear it up for you as we go along. Paul says, I was confident of this. As I planned to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. First of all, I plan to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you spend, send me on my way to Judea. When I planned this, did I do it lightly? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say yes, yes, and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the, to the glory of God. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, thanks indeed. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Faithfulness is right in the middle of this fruit cocktail. And we can see that this is in God's character. He is faithful, and because he is, because he is faithful, we can trust every other thing that's true about him. His love, his grace, his forgiveness, all of these would be nil, not much worth us, worth it to us, if he was not faithful. But because he is faithful, all of those characteristics of God mean something to us. Even his joy is faithful in every way and for everything that is true of him. His faithfulness is absolutely critical. And because of that, we know it's also true for us. Paul says that in Christ, every promise of God is yes and amen. God says it so. Jesus seals the promise. The Holy Spirit delivers the yes to us and through us to others. So it's absolutely necessary in the nature of God to be faithful. But it's also faithful, uh, a necessary uh, trait for us as well. Just think for a moment about the fact that faithfulness is critical to our relationships. Faithfulness gives rise to trust, to confidence, to assurance, to peace in our human relationships. Without faithfulness, it would be difficult to have lasting relationships. Now, faithfulness here is not essentially about being faith-filled, which you might su suspect that that was so because of the construction of the word, faithful, full of faith, right? But actually, in this case, it does not mean that. It means being one in whom faith can be put, one who can be counted on, being steadfast, reliable, dependable, a person of your word, in it for the long haul, trustworthy, unwavering, undeterred. 
The opposite, of course, of this kind of faithfulness is being inconsistent, undependable, unreliable, untrustworthy, fair weather, fickle, and flaky. As with the other eight uh, characteristics from the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, we have to look to Jesus to see what this actually looks like. It was and is a mark of his life, and so we can learn from him. In fact, it was so important to Jesus, faithfulness was, that he tells his disciples at least four parables about being faithful. In math, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them, and not in great depth, but I hope they'll stimulate a memory in you, and you can go look them up. In Matthew 24, he describes the faithful and wise servant who not only watches over uh, his holdings while the master is gone, but also watches for the return of the master. And he's rewarded for his faithfulness. And then in chapter 25, there's the parable of those to whom talents were given. And you remember that one? The talents were invested by two of his servants in wise ways, and they brought dividends and rewards for their faithfulness. But there was trouble for the one who wasn't faithful, who simply buried his treasure out of fear and a lack of trust in the nature and character of the master. These stories and others in the scriptures are reminders that not only is there joyful reward for those who are faithful to the important things, but surely there is going to be disappointment and rejection for those whose priorities in life are skewed by selfish interest or inaction. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, now it is required of those that have been given a trust, they must prove faithful. Sounds all very ominous, doesn't it? <laughs> to be honest, preaching on faithfulness to this crowd is truly preaching to the choir. <laughs> so, because many of you have been incredibly faithful to this little church for many years, long before I came, to the music ministry, to the deacons and elders, faithfulness, supporting missionaries, the bike ministry, helping with the kids, working in the Peace Garden. Whatever needs to be done, it seems like there's somebody who owns that responsibility and is faithful to it. So rather than tell you how to be faithful today, because I think you know that, I'm going to try and explore with you the things that can deter us from the fruit of faithfulness in our life. Jesus not only tells us stories about it, but then his life is a lesson in it. And so we're going to look at the record of his life, his faithfulness, because it was tested again and again in the same ways that kind of mirror how we are often tested to be faithful or unfaithful. We begin at the beginning. Jesus knew who he was and why he came, why he was here. In Luke 2, 49. This is at the end of a Passover season when he was just 12. And he didn't end up on the journey home with his parents, as you'll recall. But he was found after three days in the temple learning from those the priests and the elders and so on. And he tells his folks, I must be about my father's business. He already knew what the job was at least a little bit. And then in John 6, 38, he affirms that knowledge. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Knowing why he came and being faithful to his calling were tested throughout his life. And we're going to look at a few of those examples. What happened when I looked at them were questions came to my mind that I needed to ask my me. And I'm going to suggest them to you for asking as well. You, you can choose not to, of course. Matthew 4 was the first major test to be faithful or to abandon God's purposes and meet his own needs and desires. It came in the wilderness, delivered directly from Satan. 
Jesus was perhaps at his weakest point, so he would have had a good excuse, maybe, for not being faithful. Abandon, taunted Satan. Use your powers to feed your poor, weak self, to exalt yourself, to prove who you are. But Jesus chose faithfulness to God's purposes. I had to ask myself, do I know God's purpose for me here and now, today? Am I faithful to my calling? Do you know yours? Are you faithful to yours? Then in Mark 1.38, we read that he'd been uh, preaching and healing. This was the very beginning of his ministry. He and the disciples end up at Peter's mother-in-law's home, where he does another miracle. They all get some rest, but Jesus gets up very early the next morning to pray. And although his newly minted disciples wish him to meet the expectations of those in the village and the needs in the village, Jesus says, we need to go to other villages. That is why I have come. His faithfulness was tested by the distractions of other people's wishes and desires and even needs. Jesus was faithful. What are the distractions from others that can pull me off track and send me in the wrong direction? Who and what can distract you? I have to tell a little story here. It's a sad one for me. I was a carpooler for my daughter's uh, preschool class. And the day of my carpool, I took those little sweet things and dropped them at the uh, at their little place of child care, play, and I forgot to pick them up. I was distracted by my work. And I'll tell you, I wept tears over this because the, the child care worker, of course, called somebody else in the carpool and asked them what was up, and she had to go pick up all the kids. And that mom called me to let me know what was going on, and she was not happy. I begged and pleaded. I got kicked out of the carpool. (laughs) It was a very sad day. I cried. I wept. I pleaded. I said, give me another chance. In some things in life, it's one strike and you're out. There are no two more that you get. (laughs) And that was one of them. Oh, man. That was a harsh one. I wasn't I didn't mean to be unfaithful, but my distraction took me away from what was most important that day. I blew it. Okay. I hope you're asking yourself if you've ever been distracted. Mark 6, 33, we go on. It's after John the baptizer, Jesus' cousin, has been beheaded. And his disciples have just returned from an exhilarating but exhausting journey. And uh, they were doing, really, a mission trip. And Jesus uh, wanted to find them a place of rest where they could just kind of hunker down again, get the rest they needed, the food they needed. He was with the Twelve. When he arrived at the place chosen, he's confronted by a multitude of needy people. When he saw the 5,000-plus folks as sheep without a shepherd, his heart of compassion met their need, not his own need, for rest, and he fed them. His faithfulness was tempted or tested by a temptation to allow his personal plans to sidetrack him from God's plans. I had to ask myself, How do I respond when my best laid plans are thwarted or interrupted by the needs of others? Am I faithful to give what is in my hand to give, to serve when and where service is needed as responsible? Or do I grumble and complain and claim me time, my time, my stuff? John 14. John 16, rather. Right after feeding the 5,000, his faithfulness was tested again by the temptation to short-circuit God's plans because 
everybody who was fed thought to themselves, let's make him king. Good idea? And he is to become the king of kings. Why not just short-circuit everything and go for the gold? The temptation to run ahead of God, the temptation to forego and short-circuit what God is up to, why not speed things up and move on? So I ask, do I ever do that, thinking I know what's best? Or do I pray? Do I wait? Is my patience engaged as I wait on God? Or do I look for an easy way out? And then from Mark 10 onward, we see Jesus heading straight to Jerusalem. Knowing what lies ahead, he remains faithful. His faithfulness this time was tested by suffering, pain, and death. The question I have to ask myself is, how do I, how am I, traveling through disappointment, suffering, pain, and loss? Am I still faithful? Are you? Again, to summarize, the faithfulness of our Savior prompts me to ask, am I committed to God's purposes for my life? Are there distractions that I am prone to make that move me away from him and others? How do I respond when my plans are thwarted or interrupted? Do I try to short-circuit God, get ahead of him? And how do I move through disappointment, suffering, pain, and loss? Am I faithful? Are you? And now the caveat. Have you noticed that in our Fruit of the Spirit conversations, there's so often a caveat? Uh, yes, but. That's because these fruit are not laws. They are attitudes, motivations, character traits, which are being developed and built into our lives by the Holy Spirit for spiritual purposes and spiritual outcomes that reflect the life of Jesus. So the caveat regarding faithfulness is this. Not every situation calls for ongoing, forever in, I can be counted on to do what you need, when you need it, even to the keeping of my own promises I have made. Sometimes dogged faithfulness to a cause or a commitment needs to be set aside in order for self-care and or the realistic reassessment of a situation. The life of Scottish minister Robert Murray McChain, as cited by J. Oswald Sanders in The Joy of Following Jesus, is a case in point. Let me quote it to you. He, Robert McChain, lay on his deathbed when only 29 years old, completely worn out by his unremitting labors. To the friend sitting at his bedside as he died, McShane said, the Lord gave me a horse to ride and a message to deliver. Alas, I have killed the horse, and I cannot deliver the message. Is there a faithfulness that becomes toxic? I think yes. In our opening scripture, Paul talks about a problem he had in being faithful. He made a promise that he could not in good conscience keep. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, a second letter to this divided, unhealthy church. But before he begins to write them concerning their struggles to live out the gospel, he has to clear up this broken promise. He writes about what he's been up against in verse 8. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. In our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Paul had told them he would visit them, hoping for two visits, and he didn't even make it there once. He owns the fact. But this instance of seeming unfaithfulness doesn't mean that he treats these promises casually or minimizes them or minimizes the effect that they have on those to whom he has committed himself. He says there's no yes and no 
going on in his mind. Life interrupted well-made plans. There was no wavering. Just as there isn't any wavering in God's promises, what God says can be trusted. We can take his promises to the bank because Jesus has answered them all with a resounding yes. People, you and I, we make promises in good faith, meaning that we have every intention and all of our energy is focused on keeping that promise. And then things change. Life happens. We discover our promise was made with good intent, but without the ability to make good on our commitment. In humility, we ask for forgiveness. It may feel to us and may feel to others that we've been unfaithful. It's only wisdom that can reveal to us whether the letting go is being unfaithful or keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. It is God's Holy Spirit's guidance that parses that decision for us. Jesus promised that he would send his spirit to live within us. For one of the, the, This is one of the reasons, because we don't know the future, and yet he does. We don't know it. We don't know the contingencies that will arise in our health, our work, our world, that must reshape our actions to align with the reality we are facing. And so we're called to abide, to pitch our tent in life with Jesus, with the Spirit of God. I want to address what that looks like in the last message in this series on the fruit of the Spirit at the end of August. And I hope you'll be here with me that Sunday as we explore it together. It's not okay to just say, abide, without considering what does that mean? What does it look like? What can it look like for me? What doesn't it look like? So faithfulness. I want to end with a song that was popular, I think, well, at least it was with me, many years ago. It was by Steve Green, Find Us Faithful. Do you know it? How many of you have heard it? We could probably hum it along together, but I'm just going to read the words because I found out that you can't just record stuff and put it on the screen for everybody to see because they'll take down the whole thing when they find out you've done that. So, so I'll just read it because I can do that. Find Us Faithful. And so you can just maybe... Imagine yourself praying this prayer. We're pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Are you thinking of someone who's coming behind you? Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race as not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. O oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover Become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. O oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Did you think of someone? This means so much, this song to me. I've always been praying it for myself and Armin too. We prayed it. Because we have little ones. We had little ones. They're now big ones. And they have little ones. And they're following us. And we've done the sifting through Armin's things. And our hope is they found the steps to follow because of faithful lives. That's our prayer. 
I hope it is for yours as well. For those who come behind us, may they find us faithful. And so the amen said by Jesus to all God's promises. Find us faithful, Lord, to all the important things in life. Help us discern those distractions and those temptations to walk away from suffering or pain, to try to, to, to jump over the hoops that seem to lie before us when they're placed there by you for reasons of growth in our lives. Oh, Lord, find us faithful. We've found you faithful, and we praise you for it. In the matchless name of Jesus, who says the amen to every promise, we say, Amen. May it be so.